Hello and welcome. Uh, we are doing another interview today. We have just got back from Berlin and the uh, Soft 99 launch and today we are in London and I'm joined here by AFA. Now, uh, many of you on YouTube will already know AFA because you have a very successful YouTube channel. That's correct, yes. How many subscribers have you got? Uh, at the moment I think I'm Closing near enough to 35,000, which is really good considering about 35 times more than I don't have many videos on there to be honest with you, but uh, I think in total I have about 10 to 12 videos. Um, but yeah, roughly about four or five million views wow. between the short amount of videos that I do actually have. And do you find has that improved your business back in the day? Oh, it certainly does, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I originally started to do videos, was um, down to um, showing the customer what I actually do. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard to explain. Yes. Um, and majority of the time, you know, I say to them that I oh, first of all did a video and I said, have a look at the video and, and this is, you know, the whole process, what you're actually going to do. It was very much for an existing customer to explain how you've done and yes, achieved what you've yeah, achieved. Absolutely, yeah. So um, majority, even the customers that, um, that didn't know me, um, I could refer them to the actual video themselves so they could actually see what they're getting for their money. That's brilliant. And literally from, you know, from start to finish. That's great. Well, um, I want to first of all get to know Afra a little bit. Uh, we've known each other for a good few years. I think last time we met was at Salon Privé That's uh, in a field. Um, but the uh, journey that Afra has taken from, from where he began to uh, where we are now, and we'll do some cut scenes because you'll see it's pretty special. Um, I, I want to basically show everybody that you can do it and it takes graft, it takes uh, originality, I think. Yeah, um, definitely, yeah. You need to stand out from the crowd and I think it's a great example uh, from a detailing point of view. So if you are a, an aspiring professional detailer or a professional detailer at the beginning of your career, um, maybe you can pick up some tips on how uh, you can have a similar sort of level of success in due course. Um, and just generally, I think it's interesting to kind of keep an eye on how other people are doing and how it all sticks together. Um, and that kind of motivates you as well to go further. Yeah, totally um, agree. Yeah? Yeah, um, yeah. So. Um, you are 41 years old now. Yep, I am, yeah. But you look younger than me, which is <laughs> totally you. unfair. Um, <laughs> and um, you started, how long ago did you start in car care? Um, I would say over 15 years ago. Yeah. About 15, and so, you're a petrol head, aren't you? I love cars, absolutely. Yeah. Is that what got you into detailing? or was Yes, it? yes, definitely cars got me into detailing. Um, cleaning them, mm -hmm. making them look as, as good as possible. And when I first started off, I didn't know much, you know. Um, you're, you'd go down to Halfords, get your tea cut or mm -hmm. your, your turtle wax or the basic stuff they have there, not knowing really what they do to the vehicle, just trying to you know polish it and trying to make it shine. So as with all of us, you started by a passion with cars, yep. popping down your local sort of retail store, yep. buying some products, squirting them over a car oh, yeah. and giving a bit of a rub and see what happens. Oh yeah, you know, back then you, you, you'd get the polish and you'd polish the whole car and then it would haze white and you'd wonder why it's so difficult to actually polish off but <laughs> you didn't realise you're actually scratching the car and uh, it's a learning curve, you know, especially in the detailing industry, you, you will learn from your mistakes uh, and even 15 years later I'm still learning mm. um, and I think it's the passion that drives you to want to learn more. I, I think that's a real commonality. Every time I, I talk to an experienced detailer, a successful detailer, they always bring up more or less in the first breath how much it's a continual learning experience. Oh, yeah. And then the guys who might have been in the trade for a long time, but uh, who are kind of put less emphasis on that, tend to be kind of dwindling a little bit and sort of fading, fading from the limelight, it has to be said. Yeah, I'm really eager. You know, new products uh, are coming out all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, manufacturers are coming out with different types of paint, lacquer. Um, and it's always a learning curve, you know, um, even though you can have multiple cars, same cars, mm -hmm. same model, same colour, and you won't realise that they actually react different to, to the pads and polish. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, you started all those years ago, how did you start? Where, where did it all begin? Um, well, from a professional point of view. Um, I mean, going back to the beginning, I, I started from, you know, being an enthusiast of cars, wanting my cars to look good, um, and then my cousin owned the body shop, who you know thankfully let me practice uh, mm. on some of the panels, um, and it was there that they had a rotary that I would practice on, and that kind of let me know what the limits of these machines could do. You mm -hmm. know, you don't realise how quick you could 
ruin paint. Yeah, and, and body shops particularly, their their ambition on the whole is to get rid of the sanding marks, yeah. get the cars ready, and get them out. Oh, particularly yeah. if they're kind of insurance body shops. Yeah. And the um, so the sort of pads you know you see body shops using big, powerful, heavy Makita sort of rotaries with massive, great big wool pads oh, on, yeah. and the old uh, 3M Fast Cut Plus and all oh, the equivalents. Absolutely. Yeah. Or well, yeah. So um, yeah, it's just testing. Uh, playing around, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did that early. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew knew what the dangers were, um, and then years later on, um, you know, practicing and practicing on family and friends' cars, uh, and then you you kind of think to yourself, actually, you know, what I really enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can, you know, turn this into a business. Um, and then you know, one thing led to another. Um, using um, an old colleague's um, business warehouse that used yeah. to let me use, uh, I spring cars into there, uh, and then you know, then uh, Ru Rupes came out. And yeah. Eventually, and they kind of changed the industry. They did, yeah. The, uh, the long throw DA made it. Um, I mean, the rotary is it's it's a much harder tool to oh, use yeah. effectively. Isn't yeah, it? you know, you 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 got to be careful because you could end up polishing. And then not understanding why the paint isn't becoming perfect, and then you could be trying to refine, and you know you, you're always chasing after yourself. You've done what you're doing, mm -hmm. where the the newer machines we have these days are kind of it's, you know a bit rude to say, but it's kind of idiot proof to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, so I, I agree to an extent. It's yeah. much harder to cock up, and it's really good for a lot of new people to get into detailing because mm -hmm. you can get good results quite fast. Well, and equally the experienced guys. Um, it's, it's the speed, that's the thing. So yeah. From a commercial point of view, time is money, and it's very much the same for detailers. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And so with a long throw DA, be it a, you know, a Roops LHR15 or an XFE Flex, or the, the Festools, not the Festools, the um, Vertools and the, yeah. the kind of the cheap brand machines, um, you can, it, uh, there is an argument to say that with a long throw DA, you might not be able to get that last kind of five to ten percent, five to ten percent that you would with a rotary, and that's why a lot of pro detailers will still use rotaries mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but in terms of correction, particularly with microfiber pads, um, you can correct paint very quickly to a pretty good standard. Oh, yeah. Um, and the difference is, you know, you get a lot of the more kind of established older detailers swearing by rotary, and they do very much have a point oh, yeah. in that, yeah, you, yeah, I you know, for that nth degree. Rotary still has its has its place. Oh, definitely, yeah, it definitely does. But um, you know, we, with us, uh, especially uh, here at NVN, we've got all of the latest uh, groups, all of yeah. their machines. We're all down to little sizes, um, and we, we take our time. We don't rush jobs here. Um, you know, make sure that it all depends on what the customer wants. Um, if you, like I say to some people, if you're chasing after perfection, mm -hmm. you know, I always say. Not a, a car, trying to detail a car to 100% is not easy. You're mm. always going to have that fine, you know, one mark. And I always say you've got to be really careful because it's a fine line you're crossing there. Yes. If you're trying to chase out every single mark, it is possible. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. But then you've got to question yourself and say, um, sometimes I'd rather leave a couple of scratches here and there uh, just to keep the paint you know the levels nice yes so yeah. you know it, it has a more healthy it, it's a game of risk isn't it because if you go too far yeah. you can end up and you say right well the car is now perfect but you might have taken off so much yeah. lacquer yeah. in areas if you, <laughs> there's nothing to save it if, it if you get another mark in that Absolutely. and yeah. um, equally from a commercial point of view um, I know speaking personally when I'm doing a car and I'm, I'm not a detailer I just like to you know touch things um, is that uh, if it's my own car my own time that's one thing but if it's a customer's car and a customer's time and money yeah. um, if they if they say make this car perfect and you turn around and say well I'm gonna need two weeks for that um, there's a great write-up in a previous issue and I'm trying to remember was it issue four you're in I can't remember I think it was, I think so yeah I think it was issue four too, yeah, yeah. Um, Affa is a massive Datsun slash Nissan fan yeah uh, he has a very nice R33 which I will certainly be putting onto the screen here because I rather enjoyed it and of all the cars down Stairs, lots of multi million pound exotica. Yeah. I was immediately drawn to the R33. It's almost, almost as good as a Subaru. And um, <laughs> the article we did was actually an R32 and it just came over from Japan. Hadn't That's it? correct, yeah. And it was a kind of restoration detail. Yeah, it was an original car, really low mileage. It was sitting um, at one of my clients. Where my client bought the vehicle off a gentleman in Japan and it was sitting for 10 years. Mm. And they used to start the car and you know, get it serviced every year. But it was neglected. Low mileage, but it was just neglected from the yeah. sun, and, and 
it just needs some TLC. So well, low mileage cars, and yeah. this is another thing. It's a kind of old wives' tale. Is oh, you want a low mileage car? I mean, I'm saying this is mostly I drive a 300,000 mile car, so that's sort of a bit hypocritical. But um, low mileage cars, if they don't get used regularly, from from a uh, mechanical point of view, yeah. it's not good news. Uh, and and equally from an aesthetic point of view, unless it's in a car coon in a, in a or an equivalent yeah. airframe of some description, and it's being um, you know looked after in a in a dehumidified environment, it's not great for things like rust. And at the end of the day, that's why car was invented to stop rust oh, yeah, um, totally long time agree. Ago. yeah so that that went for a big restoration uh, I think the car was with me for two three weeks I had to order parts from Japan yeah you've got new new bolts for new the engine. bolts new caps he even wanted me to source the actual original radio yeah uh, I had a problem with the color code for the wheels no yes. one knew the color code at all uh, I ended up finding it from Japan uh, from one of the main dealers they eventually set off there a week eventually got me the color code. Um, but once the car was done, it was. It was absolutely like oh, that. Yeah. It's the classic R32 in that kind of gunmetal gray. Yeah. Um, I had a car like that, exactly the same. It was one tenth scale made by a company called Tamiya, but apart from that, <laughs> it was fine. Um, and I absolutely adored it, I thought it was a brilliant. And would you call that, I mean, was that even 100% detail? Was that sort of 98%? Um, I would say 98, yeah. yeah. There was a couple of, I mean look, it, it's been sitting outside for 10 years. Exactly, how far do you want to go? And paint, you know? paint readings were quite low. Mm -hmm. They were, I think, from about 55 to 70 microns. No, not even that, 55 to 65 microns. Correct. Really low. Well, it's something, in fact, that was brought up in the, in the last interviews we've done, yeah. and that was how um, Japanese cars, 80% of Japanese cars now, new ones sold, are ceramic coated within a kind of a month or so, and 60% of cars that are on the road in Japan Pan have got a ceramic coat on them and people you know that's crazy from our point of view ceramic coats are really what's put on nice cars and it's yeah. been quite a recent development but over there because the paint is naturally a lot thinner they, they do, don't yeah. underseal the cars because no. they don't use salt um, on the roads which is terribly good ecologically so you know it's good environmental bonus point almost makes up for the whale hunting um, but the um, paint itself is very thin in the interest of efficiency I guess um, so ceramic coating they're, they're basically reliant upon it they're dependent upon it um, and so when it comes to, to us having to work on them, it's, uh, the thin paint, you know, it says, oh, Japanese paint's always thin and soft, and that's not technically true. No, but no. it's yeah. more often than not something, it, it, it's not as thick as a Rolls Royce, no. put it that way. So I agree with that, yeah. Um, so we've got that. So you went from helping, well, working at your cousin's place, who's a, uh, who's a panel beater, you were saying? Yeah, it was so a panel beater, body shop, spray shop, it was mm -hmm. all in kind of one. Uh, yeah, so let me go there and, and um, play around with all the panels and... Mm -hmm. uh, so you were there, mm -hmm. and now you're heading up the detailing side of a huge, seriously classy new place here at NVM, and it's, yeah. it's, I mean, as you'll see from the footage, it is just sensational. I'm so chuffed about it because from a detailing point of view, from an industry point of view, the more that we start going this direction, it's going to bring it up. And you might be thinking, well, hang on, you know, I'm just an independent detail, I'm never going to have... Uh, a unit like this and a setup like this. Well, um, so was AFA, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. that long ago. No. So it is, it's certainly possible. And even if you don't want that, because the thing is when you start running a venue like this, you're starting talking about management, you're dealing with people, and you're, you're very much the detailer in this environment, aren't you? You're, you're not yeah. the overall CEO of the operation. No, no I'm, I'm Dan as the uh, detailing manager, and yeah. yeah, overall seeing literally the uh, quality control, basically everything downstairs. So you're kind of the staff side, the highest ranking sort of NCO, right in the officers who would be up here. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sort of just twiddling with computers and stuff. And that's a good place to be. You're still doing what you oh, want to do. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah, I'd rather be down there yeah. playing around with the cars, uh, you know, doing what I love. Uh, then, then be stuck in an office environment. It's just not for me. Yeah, and I think I think I, I, very few people in the industry I've met. I, I mean, quite often they, they go out of their way to say I do not like office jobs. Also, yeah. they don't like having a boss. I think you know, once you've worked for yourself for a bit, the idea of somebody else um, telling you what to do unless you're married to them seems completely outrageous <laughs> and untenable. Um, so being your own man, and I'm guessing here, you know, you've still got quite a level of independence. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I you know. Obviously, coming from owning my own business, mm -hmm. uh, I envisioned something like a long time ago. Yeah. Even before I started my own, I said, you know, the London needs uh, a totally different detailing place. Even back, you know, going back ten years ago, uh, unfortunately, there wasn't any. Majority of the detailing places that we do have these days, uh, you go into the premises, you you know, you get your price up for what it's going to cost, mm -hmm. you drop your car off. That's it, see you next week, pick your car up, and then it's all ready. Uh, here at NVN, we totally want to change that. Yeah. Uh, we want it more of a, 
relaxing, more of a car culture. It's an experience. Uh, it's an experience. That's what we want. Yeah. You know, we want this to be an experience for the customers to come down. You know, um, especially with the lounge we've got downstairs. Yeah, the lounge. Again, I've got some some footage of that. That it is. It's a very classy place. You feel like you're in an expensive sort of gin bar in London somewhere, where you yeah. know everything's kind of classy and everybody else is very pretty. Um, and it's a, it, it, as you say, it's an experience. And I think a couple of people in the recent years have tried it mm -hmm. with varying levels of success. But I think there's much more scope for this sort of thing going out there. Oh, yeah. And if you compare it also to the new car buying experience. Now I've never bought a new car in my life because. Mm -hmm you know poor but the um, a lot of people in the old days I believe when you went to buy a car you know you had a your salesman and it was a bit of a bartering and then you picked your car up and it was all kind of it was like shopping yes whereas now it's much more of a grandiose experience I mean I, I went to a, a franchised Audi dealership recently near me um, really because I needed them to plug their special computer into mine because my little computer couldn't cope with it and they offered me coffee I mean, and it was real ground coffee. It was brilliant. I had six yeah. cups of it, and they looked at me <laughs> <laughs> like I was homeless. I was like, no, no. Um, and seriously, though, it was, and, and the, the sofas were comfortable. Um, everything was very civilized, and they kept on calling me sir, which was <laughs> awesome. Um, but uh, and I think that translating into the detailing side, you know, if, if you look at garages as well in terms of non-franchise garages, quite often now you roll up, you're in a filthy unit, you get shouted at by a bloke in a boiler suit, um, and it's kind of still a bit rufty tufty to the point where, for example, um, I've got a, 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 I'm going to say I have a lot of friends, but I have people who will contact me and pretend to be my friend when they need something, like for example, double checking that when a garage has quoted six thousand pounds to replace a tire on their car, that they're not just being taken for a ride, no. um, and it is, it's intimidating for non-car people to go into a kind of a backstreet garage it's intimidating whereas um, you know if you were to go to a main dealer they know they're being charged much more but it's a comfortable safe place and I feel that downstairs even if you're not massively into detailing as a customer but you just know you want it done to your car it's a much more approachable place I mean you have to tuck your shirt in and stuff I've discovered but apart from that um, it's very approachable and I, I like that it kind of it, it takes us out of the shadows because um, quite often, you know, at social ding-dongs, not that I go to many social ding well, I'm not invited to them, I go to them. <laughs> and um, you go in there and they say, oh, so what do you do? You know, and they're just making small talks so that you oh, don't rob them. And um, I say detailing and they kind of look slightly they're blank. Of people that night, yeah. yeah. And even, and even um, car enthusiasts, it's, it's much more within the vernacular of a car enthusiast, but there's a lot of misapprehension because you know they'll say words like buffing, and I, I know buffing technically is yeah. a phrase. Or mopping. Mopping, mopping, mopping is yeah. another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and you do that there, you know, and they think you're having a fit again. Um, and the uh, so it's, it's about education, that, educating that group. And the problem is um, that you've got to make them interested in it, uh, because people like me just talking at them for hours, frankly, yeah. you know, they either fall asleep, they punch me, or they call the police, and, and it's not a successful outcome. No. Whereas when you've got places full of supercars and glamour and glitz, suddenly people are like, ooh, what's this about? You know, I want to know more. I mean, the whole concept with the lounge downstairs, uh, it's with a company called Timothy Alton. Uh, they've got a showroom in the West End, I think they've got a couple of showrooms around the world. Mm. Uh, they normally don't do commercial uh, premises. Yeah. They don't do them at all. It's the first commercial premises they uh, do. Well, they have done. Uh, and they normally do houses. I mean, their furniture is really nice. It's bespoke furniture. Mm -hmm. But they saw into our vision, um, and you know, once we explained to them what we wanted to do, they were happy to be on board uh, as well. And we've got Bang and Olsen as yeah. well, sponsor uh, sponsoring us as well. Um, which is a good tie-up because there, there, oh, yeah. which car manufacturers there are a couple you know when you, when you buy a car and if you buy something kind of conventional like a Ford or a Peugeot or something even now you can get upgraded sound systems yes. well when you get a top end Audi or even a Bentley and stuff like that there are still upgrades you can have and I know Bang & Olufsen yeah. feature quite a lot and Name are another one who do yeah, Harman Kardon as Harman well. Kardon yeah. they all do or start in domestic yeah they're Kef, all going into even. it yeah. yeah they're all slightly going into it yeah uh, so we wanted to make the experience the lounge downstairs once you walk into there, we wanted to make it as relaxing as possible. Mm. Uh, obviously, um, car orientated, but yes. at the same time, totally different. Yeah, not esoteric car orientated. Yes. It's not like going into a biker bar. No, 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 totally different. So we wanted to make it as, as comfortable and, and as relaxed as possible. So, you know, 
just relax there and have a coffee and, and no pressure and just just talk about it you know mm. not forcing anybody to bring their car in mm. and get it detailed and you know uh, our main aim is, is is to kind of make the customer relaxed and you know and then show what we do yeah there's all glass panels around so we're not hiding anything yeah so very, you mentioned it's a transparent thing and I, transparent I think that's thing. important actually yeah, I think is, yeah. you know and, and also again car dealers are doing that more and more if yeah. you go to some of the higher-end car dealers you've got big glass screens and you can see the mechanics at work uh, equally some you can even log in on your phone yeah. and watch them touching your pride and joy <laughs> yeah. yeah and fixing your car as well and you know that I think is, is, is a really key element and the coffee is really good which from my point of view is about the most important thing <laughs> um, and no I, I think it's great so that trip because we, we haven't mentioned the M word motor shine because yes. that's been your business yes uh, yeah <laughs> for a long that time is, has been for a long time um, and basically um, as I said, I envisioned something like this a long time ago. Yeah. Um, where I'm based, my, my lease was running out soon. And a bit for, you're out of London, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, in of Hertfordshire, up in there in Hertfordshire. Um, so I was looking for a bigger premises. Um, I had a couple of investors on board. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine from the cars that you worked on, you're probably moving and shaking in the right sort of circles for yes, people with a yeah, bit of... Yeah, I had some investors that were, you know, keen because, uh, you know, the PPF, uh, it's, it's really growing now. Yes. Um, so, and at the same time, this came about. So, um, I got in contact with uh, the owners here, which I've already got MVN in Dubai. Yes. Which they're the number one detailing center and PPF center in Dubai. There, they're absolutely huge over there. Uh, and the the amount of cars and the quality they're turning around. Uh, and we're really tied with, with the UAE in general. Yeah. Um, there is a, a particularly in terms of car culture. There is a real bond to the point where a couple of times a year, uh, a lot of the guys down there bring themselves and their cars oh, yeah. Yeah. up here and hoon around Belgravia and oh, other yeah. flash parts of London, down there. Absolutely. obsessing the residents, which is hilarious. And you've got all the supercar spotters now, so the Instagrammers, you've got the kids, and we had them down here, all these kids with these yeah. fancy pants G7 cameras oh. going around and taking weird photos and all the rest of it. And it's great, you know, there was a real yeah, following. It is good fun. So yeah, and then we eventually got talking. Um, I mean, regardless of, um, the business and, and my passion comes first. Yeah. So this is where you've got a kind of base down to where um, I've got to go down to my roots and mm -hmm. I love detailing to begin with. The main thing is is, is if you follow your dreams and, and you love what you do, money will, money will eventually come into it. Mm -hmm. But you have to be passionate and, and you've got to do a good job. Yeah, you've got to uh, have that cool. Money is secondary. I know it is important. It, yeah. You need to make a living. I totally understand that. But if you're out, if you're out for, for detailing just to earn money out of it, then you, you fail to begin with. And people don't realise how much graft goes in. Yeah. Well, you could yeah. argue that the ones who've, who've tried to, to create this customer experience thing are a bit more money orientated, uh, and that might be why things aren't necessarily going so brilliant. No. Right? No, I agree. I mean, I used to get up Sunday, four o'clock in the morning, three mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning, uh, working seven days a week. You know, I was never scared of work. My father used to tell me an old phrase, don't, you know, don't be scared of work, let work be scared of you. Okay. Don't ever be scared of work. So I'm, I'm not one to get stuck in and put a lot of hours in. People don't realize that. A lot of people see the fancy videos, the yes. fancy photos, they see all this side, but don't realize that you're putting 10, 12, 13 hours yeah. in a day sometimes, you know, they don't see that side of it. And what's really important here though, is first of all, you mentioned the vision. You, you visioned this yeah. 10 years ago. Probably and I a think long time ago, yeah. There are a lot of people in car care, professionals, who've been in, you know, even longer than you, yeah. 25, 30 years yeah. in some cases, but they've never had the long game. It's always about earning, earning the dollar that day or that week to pay the mortgage. And I, I, again there's yeah. nothing yeah, wrong with that yeah. but you've got to have a long-term goal yes and plan it out it's like with business plans it's that um i you know i talk to a lot of people who are starting up or, or at a certain stage of change we say in their business and i say well, how do i do this how do i go about it i say plan because with business plans the key is it makes you think about it it makes yeah. you write it down and just the kind of aesthetic process of writing it down helps and if you ignore it completely and do something totally different that's cool hell i've written probably three dozen yeah. business plans and i haven't followed one of the damn things but right. they make you think it does i mean before i mean the reason i went to hertfordshire see i live in london myself yeah so the reason i went to hertfordshire was uh, a lot of my family are down there yeah and the rent the rent is what drew me down there and and the main thing with the detailing industry is you're not picking, you know, your customers are not coming off the street. It's the majority of them are appointment only. Yes. So it's a telephone call, make an appointment, come down for so consultation. So footfall isn't an issue. Yeah. So area was an issue for me. Um, 
before that I had a look at place in London but the rent is very expensive mm. very very expensive um, but a long time ago I envisioned you know a really nice open space clean mm. Uh, really like high-end detailing centre. Well, how many square foot is this place, do you know? I think a thousand, is it a thousand? It's going to be more than a thousand. It's, uh, uh, I, I it's a it lot. Might, it might be a thousand square metres. So, yeah, I think it's a thousand square metres. A thousand meters. square metres, it's yeah, big. And you were yeah. saying even the floor tiles were like 70 grand. But they, they were a lot, lot yeah, yeah, a lot of the, you know, we even go down to these fine details, but at the end of the day, this is what I say to a lot of people, everything you see around us <clears> is, you know, it's nice. And it's more for the customer, yeah. but um, I could do what we're doing here in an empty garage yes. with not a lot of lighting. M my point to that is, is it's the quality of work. Yeah, it all boils down to That's the craftsman yeah. and the individual. So uh, you can have all the nicest, you know, equipment and and you know showing off this and showing off that. Yeah but it all boils down to the work. And that's what you've got to realise. And once you've got that, uh, you know, once you've got that locked down, then, then you're fine. If you, if you, if your focus goes away from that. Then uh, yeah, it's yeah. going to be hiding nothing. So in summary, in conclusion, uh, the key to doing what AFA has, has, has proved can be done is to have a long-term plan. Do not be scared of graft. Don't take money as the primary thing, be it short term or long term, it's not necessarily about the money. Yeah. And above all, make sure you are a master, I mean, again, I've heard this so many times, a master of your trade, you're a specialist in what you do. And yeah. within, I've seen, admittedly, I've seen some very, very good detailers who have never really succeeded because they haven't got other things in a row, yeah. but you're never gonna get long term success if you haven't mastered what you're trying to do in terms of the core yeah. skills of it. Oh. Totally agree. I mean, even now I'm looking for courses to do, and you know, it's just the hunger, the mm. hunger to learn more. And I think once you lose that, then you know, it'll, it'll show in your work. Yeah, absolutely. And you can tell. And and I mean, you know, now and then you might have a Saturday afternoon job, so to speak, but. Um, you can tell. I mean, there are, there are companies that kind of go up and down, and they're the, the particularly yeah. the, the bigger ones. And you, you sometimes they do really, really good work, and you've seen it, and it's amazing. Yeah. And then a couple others, maybe it's done by a different individual or something like that, and it's it's not quite there. Mm -hmm. So I think consistency is going to be important because yeah. again, it'll take you years to build a reputation, but oh, it can, yes. you can take yeah. your seconds to lose it if you're not oh, yeah. careful. But the other thing is, don't be afraid of failure. No, no. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in this and, and speaking, you know, we run a, a trade association, the PVD Trade Association, and it's, it's, it's hard work and it's a matter of sort of pushing forward and developing and working out and evolving how it all works. And I think if you're afraid of failure, you'll never have the balls to go and take a risk. And sometimes taking that risk and taking that step out of your comfort zone is really important. Affa, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I think well, you've got some real insight and I think more importantly is that you're an example of how you can go from somebody helping out a cousin in a body shop yeah. to starting your own business in a little unit in Hereford, yeah. Shura, Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire brother, yeah. um, and then you grow that customer base, you both grow that skill set, you develop that enthusiasm, you build that customer loyalty and knowledge and um, eventually you get to a spot like this, and this is a whole new chapter for you, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, um, absolutely. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, and I hope you guys are looking forward to seeing how it develops, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that there'll be lots on YouTube. You're, you're working with a famous YouTube person who's yeah. escaped my mind. James, Mr. JWW. Mr. JWW, so if you yeah. have a look at him on, on YouTube, I think he's got at least half a million followers and stuff he, like that. Yeah, he is well known on YouTube. So <clears> I'm <throat> sure he will be uh, coming over here and doing lots of updates, and I'm sure I will be here at some point soon um, yeah. doing another update so that'd be fun but um, all it leaves me to do is say thank you very much for taking the time brilliant it's been a pleasure likewise cheers